holy gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. This is the testimony given by John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed, and did not deny it, but confessed, I am not the Messiah. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? Let us have an answer for those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As the prophet Elijah, as Isaiah said, now they have been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing? If you are neither the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet. John answered them, I baptize with water. Among you stands one whom you do not know, the one who is coming after me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. This took place in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to the Lord Christ. I want to talk to you today about giving God the credit. John the Baptist was called by Jesus the single greatest person in his generation. He was called the greatest person of the entire Old Testament. That's how highly Jesus thought of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was famous in his own day. Everybody in his world had heard about him. The crowds were coming out to gather in front of him, to listen to him. Kings knew about his words and were offended when he said something that, uh, that spoke against them. To John the Baptist, tax collectors came. We have today the Levites and people sent from the Pharisees came. Even Roman soldiers came to John the Baptist to ask for advice. He was a big deal. When these folks came to him, and we hear the passage today, and they asked him, who are you? This was John's chance to shine. I am the light to my generation, he might have said. I am the one who God wants you to listen to, he may have said. I am the person who has been appointed to transform my entire age, he might have said. He says none of these things. When they ask him who he is, time and again, he refuses to take positions of honor, titles of honor, though he might have. And finally, when they ask him who he is, he says very clearly, I am not the light, but I have come to testify to the light. John, the biggest deal in his generation, insists on being the second banana to the one who has called him, to the one who is filled with the power that he himself is wielding. I have come not to be the light, not to have the attention on me, but to testify to the true light which is coming into the world. John gives God the credit. How often have you been on the edge of doing something really difficult and important and so you've prayed about it and asked God to give you the strength, give you the insight, give you the gifts, give you the talent and the discipline and the effort to be able to accomplish it. And once you get to the other side of that accomplishment, it happens, you absolutely forget to give God thanks. Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. I can remember getting to those moments and then it's such a relief when the moment passes and you're so glad that it happened so well that usually for me it's some time later 
when I suddenly realized, oh my goodness, I've forgotten to thank the Lord. Maybe it's minutes later, maybe it's hours later, maybe it's days later. I suppose there's some credit there that at least I remembered. But there is a tendency in us, when we accomplish something great, to have the attention be focused on us and to forget to thank the one who gave us all of the abilities to accomplish it in the first place. I wonder if you know the story of Nehemiah. It's found in the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. And today I'm thinking about chapter 6. Nehemiah is appointed over the people of Israel once they return back from exile. They've been in Babylon for a generation. They've been allowed to come back to their own land. It's been 70 years and everything has been torn down. Nehemiah's job is to rebuild there's two books in the Bible about rebuilding, by the way, Ezra and Nehemiah. Neither of them are very long. You may find it interesting to read these books because they're all about taking Israel from garbage and building it back up because for 70 years it has been desolate. Nehemiah is in charge, and one of the first things he wants to do is to rebuild the walls around the city of Jerusalem. Why? Because they were surrounded by enemies on every side. You know how bad people downriver want like a Trader Joe's or a Costco? And as soon as there is one, that is, everybody's going to like pour into the place. That's what Jerusalem was like. It's like everybody was wishing Jerusalem could be great again so they could come and pillage it. And suddenly, there's people in Jerusalem again. They've got wealth again. They've got farmers. They've got gifts. They've got food. And suddenly, Jerusalem's starting to shine again, and they couldn't wait to get inside and take it. Nehemiah wants to rebuild those walls. As he's building the walls, some of his enemies come to him and they're like, you know, we'd love to have a conversation with you out on the plain of Ono. Just come on over. We just want to talk to you for a second. He realizes they want to kill him so that he won't finish the walls. Then one of his friends comes to him and says, Nehemiah, as the walls are going up, Nehemiah, you know what? People are after you. You should come into the temple. We'll close all the doors and we won't let anybody in. We'll keep you safe. And Nehemiah's like, wow, my friend really cares about me. Suddenly he realizes he's been paid by the enemies. They're trying to separate Nehemiah from the rest of the people so they can come and destroy the city. Nehemiah refuses to fall for any of these tricks. He continues to call his people to build and to build. And then the scripture says in Nehemiah 6 that he finishes rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. Now, I don't know if that sounds long or short to you, but I want you to imagine there were no, like, bulldozers, right? Nobody had cranes. We're talking huge stones that were all laying next to each other on the ground, putting them on top of each other, high enough, all the way around the city. 52 days was a miracle. And what Nehemiah says about this is striking. He says that all of the enemies of Jerusalem are now afraid of, Jeru of, of Jerusalem, that all of their own esteem has fallen in their own eyes because they know that the Lord is the one who built the walls. Nehemiah wants everyone to know, these are not my walls. This is not because of my great leadership. I was a part of it, sure, but these are God's walls. God is the one who made this thing happen. And you're not simply attacking me or my people. You come against these walls. You're coming against God's walls. And there is no way that you will succeed. He gives God the credit. And because of that, the walls of Jerusalem continue to stand. It's not only in success that we have to remember to give God the credit. Sometimes we need to testify to the light even when times are difficult. I wonder if you know the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel was a teenager when that exile happened. He was in Jerusalem, Babylon attacked, Babylon wins. They start taking people out of Jerusalem, bringing them back to Babylon. And Daniel as a teenager is one of the people who is forced to work for the king of Babylon. Daniel is the one book in the entire Old Testament that is 100% entirely positive. Daniel never does anything wrong during the time of the exile. He is a superhero in this time. He is absolutely a role model and supposed to be an idol for anyone who would be wanting to know how to live during this challenging time. 
and by extension during the challenging times in our own, in our own lives. Daniel rises up in authority. You know, they, they, did, they took these people from Babylon because they were good at things. And then they put them in charge of those things in Babylon. Daniel rose in authority. He rose in power. He rose in authority until there was simply the king and then Daniel and two other people and then 120 administrators below them leading the entire country of Babylon. Daniel was one of the top three. Daniel, throughout his life, continued to worship the living God. It was not the God of Babylon. And in fact, it was, um, it was very much sort of against the Babylonian principles for Daniel to keep worshiping his God. But it worked so well for him, the king allowed it. The two other governors and all of the administrators, when they heard that Daniel was doing so well that the king of Babylon wanted to put him above all of them, so it was King Daniel, everybody else, they decided it's time to get rid of this guy. And they decided to make Daniel's life extremely difficult. They uh, come to the king and they say, you know, king, you're such a great king. You're such a what they buttered him up, right? They said, you know what? You should make an edict that says for 30 days, no one can worship anyone but you. Wouldn't that be great, king? And the king, not being a person of faith, goes along with it. He signs an edict that says everyone in the nation should worship or pray only to him for 30 days. Now, what are you going to do if you're Daniel? If you have believe in the God of your ancestors, if God is the one who is powering you and strengthening you, what are you going to do? Are you going to stop worshiping God for 30 days? Maybe God won't care if you stop praying. You know, maybe you could just go into your room and lock the doors and close all of the curtains and you could pray to God, but nobody will know. Daniel insisted on testifying to the light, on testifying to God, even when everything seemed like it was turning against him. Daniel went into his house three times a day to the second story where everybody could see with all the windows open, and he bowed down and prayed and worshiped to God every morning, every afternoon, and every night. Even though he knew that part of the edict was, if anyone worships any other God, they'll be thrown to the what? The lions. Even though he knew with the lions on the other side, with people on every side trying to attack him and trap him, even the king seeming to be against him, allowing the edict, what does Daniel do? He continues to shine. He continues to worship God. He continues to glorify God and testify to the power and the majesty, the right of God to be worshipped. The king finds out. Next thing you know, the scripture doesn't have any narration at all. Daniel's thrown into the lion den. No conversations, no story about him getting dragged out of the house. Boom, Daniel's in the lion's den. And the king goes home that night. They seal it, by the way, with wax and with uh, seals on their, on their rings. The king goes home, he can't even eat dinner. He tries to sleep, he can't even sleep. He's so anxious because he cares so much about Daniel and he's so interested and concerned about what's going to happen to him. Will his God protect him? It says the king rises up early in the morning and at first light, he moves the stone out of the way and he calls down to him and he says, Daniel, servant of the living God, Listen to these words of faith in the king's voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has the God whom you serve so carefully protected you through the night from the lions? And Daniel's heart just exults as he hears these voices, this word from the king, and he says, O oh, king, may you live forever. May you live forever. The king has just proclaimed the living God, and Daniel has just affirmed to him, you have just experienced and entered into eternal life. Daniel's faithfulness in, during the time of challenge has changed the mind and the heart of the king of Babylon. And on that day, the king of Babylon was saved. To testify to the light, testify in the good times, to testify in the bad times, to testify even so that other people around us might hear. Because it makes a difference. I can remember being a child watching television. It was like the end of a show, and like the 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 um, the, uh, the the 
the protagonist boy or the protagonist girl end up together in the end. They were like teenagers. It was like the sweet made-for-TV movie, right? And in the end, they like walk back to their houses in the neighborhood hand in hand. And I can remember my mother saying, well, I guess the Lord wanted them to be together. That has stuck with me now for how many years? For like 32 years of my life, I can remember my mother saying, I guess the Lord wanted them to be together. And why did it matter? She was testifying to the Lord. She might have thought that, but she was willing to say it. And because she said it, it affected me. When we're surrounded by people, they, when they hear our words, it influences them and directs them. Too often we want to stay quiet because we think this is my personal thing. I don't want to affect anybody, you know. And you know what happens? You don't affect anybody. We raise our children, but we don't want to, like, you know, influence them overly, so we don't talk about God in the home, and we don't talk about faith in the home, and we don't say God must have desired that in the home, and then we're shocked when they grow up, and they don't have any particular faith, and they never particularly talk about God. We were trying to be careful. We were trying to be quiet. We thought maybe it was a personal thing, and because we never testified to the light, it didn't catch. But when we testify to the light, the light has a power of its own to ignite the heart and carry people forward in life. I can remember being a counselor at a summer camp, and there was a particularly um, charismatic priest who came for one week to teach a program, and he always talked about the Lord. He said, you know, praise the Lord, or, you know, the Lord really wants this to happen, or I think, you know, I, think I just want to thank the Lord. Let, let's pray to the Lord for a moment. He used this phrase, which was, like, so particular nobody ever talked about the Lord, you know? Like, if we talked about God, we never used that phrase. Do you know by the end of the week, everybody was talking about the Lord? My own sister, I remember being shocked. She's like, well, you know, I guess the Lord just really went. I was like, what? Even my sister's talking about the Lord. When you testify to the light, it catches. It influences people. It makes a difference. Do you remember the story when Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb? He said, Lazarus, come out. And they said, I thank you, God, for having heard me. And what does he say after that? I knew that you always heard me, but I have said this so that these people might hear. To testify to the light. My friends, I want to call you and encourage you to testify to the light in your life. Because there are walls in your life that need to be built. And God is going to give you the power and the strength to be able to build them. You're going to succeed. And testify to the light when you do. And thank the Lord for what he's given you to be able to do it. There's going to be down times in your life. Testify to him through them. And watch his power to carry you through. And recognize that God wants us all to share in this good news. And when you testify, people will hear it and hearts will be touched and lives will be changed. Don't keep that light under a bushel, but let it shine. God wants us to speak because when we speak, we're acknowledging the one from whom all power comes, the one through us all power works, the power of God to save, to heal, to redeem, and to make us strong. Amen. Amen.